Footprints presents The Incredibles, a series where you meet ordinary but incredible individuals. I was, by nature, a fan of dolls ever since I was a child. With some fabrics, needles, thread, and a pair of scissors, a figurine is made by hand, using only natural coloring and materials. This technique cannot be found in any other part of the world. Not even one silk figurine we made was sold in more than a year. Can I keep on going? My name is Tang Yan. I'm the CEO of the Beijing Tang Renfang Culture Development Company, dedicated to making Beijing silk figurines, also known as Tang Wawa or the Tang Dolls. For over two decades, Tang Yan has made efforts to strike a balance between innovative designs in figurine making and traditional cultural heritage preservation. From loving dolls to making China's own brand name, Tang Wawa, what's the driving force behind her passion and dedication? What difficulties and challenges has she met along the journey? To find out more, let's tune into this episode of Footprints and hear how Tang Yan has become the mother of the modern yet traditional Chinese doll. Stay tuned. On a cool autumn morning in September 2022, the artisans of Tang Yan's handicraft workshop were getting ready to start another busy day. In the spacious production room, everyone was deeply involved in their work. Some were doing makeup for the dolls, others were cutting out silk and satin pieces to make dresses, while a few were making a traditional Chinese hairdo for these silk figurines. Working in a synchronized pace, these craftspeople form an assembly line for producing Tang Wa Wa, a modernized version of Beijing silk figurines. This unique traditional Chinese craftsmanship is known as Beijing Junren in Chinese. Tang Yan is the principal of the workshop. She pauses here and there to give her students, or rather apprentices, advice and suggestions. At that moment, the rhythmic sounds of sewing, brushing and fabric cutting are the soundtrack to a scene where artistic and cultural inheritance, restoration and innovation are taking place before our very eyes. The silk figurine has a history of more than a thousand years in China. In fact, it has existed since the Han Dynasty and its peak would be in the Tang Dynasty from 618 to 907 AD. The earliest examples of silk figurines were the three dolls discovered in Astana, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region in northwest China. The unearthed dolls were all decorated with the costumes and colored makeup, typical of the Tang Dynasty style, representative of the fashion back then. Tang Yan told us, though the silk figurines have been given the cute name of Tang Wa Wa, they used to be and still are more than just toys for play and display. They are dolls made exquisitely with valuable materials using state-of-the-art craftsmanship for artistic purposes and thus require delicate handling and proper protection. The doll brings along a sort of spiritual entertainment and belonged to the category of luxury goods in ancient times. Far from meeting people's physical needs like eating and drinking, it was more to do with enjoyment and pleasure, making it unnecessary during turbulent times. So, in the late Qing dynasty, many exquisite silk figurines were lost and people stopped making them. However, being buried, lost and forgotten in history is not the fate of the Chinese figurine. Its re-emergence as Tang Wa Wa is not a pure coincidence. 
It requires two similar popular sayings to expound why such an incredible thing should have eventually happened. People often say, all that glitters is not gold, but gold will glitter forever. All things in their being are good for something. The figurine making craftsmanship is the gold that glitters and Tang Yen's talent is put to good use in reviving it. In fact, earlier in the 1950s, silk figurines were dusted off and its sparkle revealed. A team of Chinese handicraft masters were summoned to bring this ancient art back to life. 其实，在全世界哈，每年都会有各种玩偶艺术展会。Every year, various exhibitions and fairs on dolls and toys are held worldwide. And after New China was founded, our country was invited to participate in one of these international toy fairs. The Ministry of Culture immediately assigned famous female artisans to study which type of doll could represent China. And under the leadership of Master Ge Jingan, the small team of artisans restored the old way of making silk figurines. They were based in Beijing back then, and the finished doll was named Beijing Figurine. Beijing Jianren. According to Tang Yan, rediscovering the traditional silk figurine making techniques was beset with difficulties. The female handicraft artists had to rely on collected documentary materials from various historical resources. Ge 老师他们这一代大师也研究了历代 Back then, Mrs. Ge and her team studied the forms of various Chinese dolls from different time periods, all using traditional handicraft skills and natural materials to restore the ancient style. Eventually, they produced five figurines displaying women from different ethnic minorities. Which, not surprisingly, were widely regarded as outstanding artworks in their own right at an international doll fair held in India in 1954. Later, a research team and a silk handicraft producing factory were established in Beijing to further promote and support this type of folk art as a traditional Chinese cultural heritage. Based on historical records and unearthed cultural relics, the team restored and designed many classical figurines depicting male or female characters in folk tales, mythologies, or folk operas. These designs were later made into silk figurines by factory artisans using the good old doll-making techniques, just as ancient Chinese craftspeople once did in the past. I heard from the factory director that when they were at their peak, hundreds of doll makers used to work together under one roof, since the procedures were all completed by hand, which required a large workforce. They received plenty of overseas orders, earning a large amount of foreign exchange for the country at that time. In the 1970s and 1980s, the silk figuring factory was prospering. That was the time when little Tang Yan, around ten years of age, was dreaming about owning a Yang Wawa, a doll of her own. It is a time when Chinese people were still living with scarcity, and the country was about to embark on economic reform. I was, by nature, a fan of dolls ever since I was a child. I was crazy about them, and sometimes I would freeze on the ground when I saw the dolls I liked in the shop window. Usually, I would cry to my mother and ask her to buy the doll for me. But at that time, our family was not well off. My parents had to support a large family, so spending money on toys was a luxury. In a rather light-hearted way, Tang Yan laughed and vividly described how hard it had been for her mother to drag her away from the exhibition window, where all the pretty dolls were on display. Not owning a Yang Wawa of her own couldn't stop little Tang Yan from fancying one. Back home, Tang Yan would make toys for herself, a DIY hobby encouraged by her parents. My mom said, "I was three years old when I would make clothes for dolls." My mother told me that I was making clothes for dolls when I was three years old, so I guess I do have some talents in this regard. And I remember I loved drawing ancient Chinese maidens when I was young. My father has kept some of my drawings from age ten to thirteen in an album. Inside, there were all kinds of maidens I drew, dressing in ancient Chinese style. There were the female characters from the Peking opera piece, heavenly maids scattering flowers. 
and the Twelve Beauties of Jinglin from the famous Chinese classical novel The Dream of the Red Mansions. The drawings and paintings have become Tang Yan's cherished childhood memories. They brought her great satisfaction when she was a little girl and prepared her for a job in IT programming after growing up. Back in the 1980s, Tang Yan's father used to work in the IT industry. He contributed to building China's newly emerged computer science industry. The family lived close to Beijing's Zhongguanzun area, a place people at the time often referred to as China's Silicon Valley. Like father, like daughter. Plus, it was a time when the whole nation believed in saying that once you have studied science, you would own an unbreakable iron rice bowl for life. It is no wonder that a doll lover would be turned into a second-generation computer nouveau riche geek upon graduation from university. By the mid-1980s, China's industrial and technological reforms had achieved substantial success in several areas, including the computer science sector, bringing Tang Yan numerous opportunities for personal development in the tech field. Like many other coders and software engineers back then, she earned her first bucket of gold by starting her own computational service company and was constantly making business trips abroad. However, according to Tang Yan, though successful in business as a self-made entrepreneur, often she would still detect in herself the little girl who refused to be dragged away from the lovely dolls. To quench the thirst, she developed a habit Wherever and whenever she saw a lovely doll, she'd bring it home. Tang Yan calls it love at first sight. I ended up with this complex for dolls. Now that I can afford to buy the beautiful dolls myself, I couldn't help adding them to my collection whenever I saw one displayed in front of me. So I later on became a crazy doll collector. And if I went abroad or traveled around and saw one that I really like, I would take the doll out of the shop window and bring it home, even if it was dusty and old. Among her collection, there were famous dolls such as Barbie dolls from the US, Ningyo dolls from Japan, and Bisque dolls from Germany. But there wasn't one which had been made in and from her own home country, China. Growing up, we used to call the dolls Yang Wawa, or literally overseas dolls in English. The term itself in Chinese already has an underlying important meaning. Yet, for all these years, I've never really owned a doll that could be called a Chinese doll. So back then, I couldn't help but wonder, why do we have no doll of our own in China? Even after the question had formed in her mind, Tang Yan still had no idea that in the future she would be the one to fill up the vacancy in her collection with authentically and artistically made Chinese dolls. Before that day came, she had indulged herself and tried her best to share her passion and her collection of dolls with others. The more the better, and the happier she became. In the mid-1990s, China was deeper into its economic reform. International supermarkets and shopping malls started to rush in to secure their market positions in the country's first-tier cities such as Beijing, Shanghai and Guangzhou. That was when Tang Yan was approaching her 30s. One day, she spotted a picture of a doll in a display window in one of the shopping malls in Beijing. It was an image that shocked her and quickened her heartbeat. Dressed in a full set of white Peking opera costume and matching makeup, the figurine lit up Tang Yan's eyes. I went weak at the knees, staring straight at that doll. I asked the shop assistant which doll it was and who made it. She checked their displaying record and told me. It was called a silk figurine and had been made by an artisan named Yang Naihui from the Beijing Silk Figurine Factory. Staring at the doll, the idea that this silk figurine would help make her collection complete struck her. It was the Chinese doll she had been looking for, and it was so different from the dolls she had been collecting over the years. With some fabrics, needles, thread, and a pair of scissors, a figurine is made by hand, using only natural coloring and materials. So, unlike plastic or porcelain dolls, it is hard to mass-produce. 
Meanwhile, China has been known for its fine silk and silk trading since ancient times. And this technique of making dolls with natural silk cannot be found in other parts of the world. It is a Chinese doll, authentic and unique. With the help of the shop assistant, Tang Yan decided to track down the silk figurine factory without hesitation, hoping to be able to meet with Yang Nai Hui, the craftswoman, in person. In the 1990s, the silk figuring factory was basically shut down. The cost of natural materials rose rapidly, which made it difficult to export the dolls. The doll makers were dismissed, and there was only one member of staff left when I got there, guarding and managing the warehouse before the dolls inside were moved elsewhere. He told me Mrs. Yang Naihui had gone home long ago and allowed me to look through the silk figurines in their warehouse. I picked 10 dolls and bought them all. When I got home, I took two of them apart and studied how it was made from the inside out, only to realize it was rather complicated. At that time, I wanted to learn the skill, and I had to find Mrs. Yang Naihui. Without smartphones and modern chat apps we take for granted today, looking for a person with so little information was like searching for a needle in a haystack. After months of door knocking and name card distribution, a phone call arrived. It was Mrs. Yang Naihui. She wondered why an IT girl like me would want to learn skills from her. But she was happy when she heard about how much I love dolls and my passion for traditional arts and culture. She was really nice and said she would love to teach me. With that phone call, I abandoned my career in computer science and threw myself into silk figuring making. At the turn of the century, switching jobs from the promising technological sector to the rather laid-back and sluggish traditional handicraft field was a rarity, and to most people, an incomprehensible move. But for Tang Yan, making such a decision wasn't a struggle. She is grateful for her family's unconditional support. My parents, my husband, and even my son were very supportive of my decision. They all know about my so-called doll complex and would spoil me with a gift doll every year when we celebrated my birthday. My husband even went further and let me do whatever pleased me and not to worry about the financial income. So they all encouraged me to do what my heart longed for. With a clear aim and high morale, Tang Yan wasted no time in taking action. With her savings, she bought a big apartment as a workshop and managed to gather six people with similar interests around her. They became students of Yang Nai Hui and another artisan, Jia Xiao Pu, who later joined the team as a teacher. But things turned out to be much more difficult and challenging than expected. It was even more complicated than I thought. We began by pasting cotton cloth and natural silk on the figurine's head, two layers each. And before putting on the next layer, we would spend nearly a whole day slowly adjusting the shape of the facial features to have the fabric fit better with the figurine's expressions. Sometimes my finger would start to get painful after hours of adjustment. Then, when one layer is completely dry, we start with the next layer. The facial adjustment could take a whole week to finish. And that is the only first step of making silk figurines. Making a silk figurine usually involves 12 steps, each requiring sophisticated skills and ingenious craftsmanship. With gauze and cotton as flesh, and metal wire as bones. The figurine is usually lined in silk from head to toe, and the head alone could take up to two months to complete. Though everyone was faced with such a daunting task, Tang Yen's obstinacy in character, talent in painting, and passion for dolls helped her to excel amidst frustrations. All my hobbies as a kid prepared me for what I'm doing now. At that time, I like watching Chinese literary classics like Dream of the Red Mansions, The Water Margin, and Journey to the West. 
And if I fail to understand something read once, I'd read it all over again and would repeat that until I could understand each word. As I read the fiction, the characters' images would simply draw themselves in my mind. Some would say my visual thinking is relatively strong. There had indeed been countless times when I was uncertain about this path. Can I keep on going? Why do I keep on going? And for what? I remember constantly asking myself these questions. But having experienced every step along the way, I eventually decided to stick to it. And I'm certain that giving up is not in my dictionary. It may have something to do with my character, since I never change my direction easily once it's settled. Day in and day out, she confined herself in the workshop, mending, adjusting, and learning from her failures. Her efforts eventually paid off. Within half a year, Tang Yen mastered the 12 steps and was able to attend to the details, especially on the doll's headgear and the embroidery on the dresses with great patience. Armed with such skills and expertise, Tang Yen had every reason to believe that she and her workmates were certainly closer to her aspiration of making their own Chinese doll, Tang Wa Wa. But just as one popular saying goes, while an idea is plump, the reality is usually skinny. Days and months went by with a thinning wallet. Tang Yen was repeatedly reminded that it was too early to feel content. The ability to make a doll is not enough. The products have to undergo the test of the market, and making a profit is a must for any business in order to become sustainable. For more than a year, not even one silk figurine we made was sold due to our lack of distribution channels. Even though the Palace Museum wanted to include our work in their gift shop. But unfortunately, they returned all the dolls to us, since no tourist would pay 2,000 RMB for one. 2,000 RMB is about 276 US dollars now, a price obviously way too high for consumers of dolls. But given the artisanship, the cost of labor, the natural material and the time and energy spent on making it, it was not at all an overpriced product in the market. It was a bitter memory as Tang Yen recalled when she witnessed four of her six teammates quit out of despair. Being a soldier, she decided to fight on. As the founder of the workshop, a place where she harbored her dream, she refused to surrender and was forced to look for ways to get out of the quagmire. Uh, we were under a lot of pressure and started to wonder whether we would shut down the workshop. But no. There's got to be a way out. And since the head and hands of the figuring are the most expensive and time-consuming parts, I'll start from there and see how I could simplify the process. Changing the processing methods and materials meant altering and breaking away from the traditional ways of making the doll, an act astray from preserving the inherited artisanship. It was thinking out of the box and not an easy decision to make, but it was a matter of survival for Tang Yen and her Tang Wa Wa. Luckily, once more, Tang Yen got full support from her family. Using their private savings again, she hired new staff and trained them with skills while burying herself in experiments aimed at lowering the cost of production. Tang Yen tried replacing natural silk with silk imitation materials. In order to shorten the time-consuming procedure of manual drawing and painting, she bought a digital printer for the team. The most difficult step was making the doll's head and forming the details of its limbs. When trying to upgrade and simplify the process, we adopted plaster and several other materials and tried to mass-produce them through molding. We also recruited more handicraft staff and a mode maker to help design and conduct experiments on the different modes to achieve the ideal results. After a year of brainstorming, equipment purchasing and product adjusting, we finally had the perfect doll head that could be mass-produced. Tang Yen named her modified products the Tang Dolls or Tang Wa Wa in Chinese. 
According to her, the name represents a facelift of an old traditional handicraft. These newborn babies are innovative creations based on the ancient silk figurine-making craftsmanship that peaked in the Tang Dynasty. The skills of making Tang Wawa originate from traditional figurine-making procedures, with the filigree plating and color painting techniques preserved in making the doll's hair and dresses. To me, it is more like an innovative version of the silk figurine in the modern-day context, which could still be a symbol of the Chinese figuring art form. Apparently, the market agreed with Tang Yan, as Tang Wawa received a warm welcome from customers all across the globe. One of the most eye-catching moments of glory for Tang Wawa is the limelight they were put under during the Beijing 2022 Olympic and Paralympic Winter Games earlier this year. Tang Wawa was selected as customized gifts placed in rooms in the Olympic Village, welcoming athletes from all over the world. Exquisitely made and all dressed in traditional Peking opera costumes, after the games were over, over 1,000 Tang Wawa traveled back home with these sports people as Chinese cultural ambassadors. The public very much appreciated our products. We even expanded and set up several branch factories to meet the demand. However, half of the procedures were still traditional and laboriously handmade. So there had been times when the next order had already arrived before we could finish and deliver the previous patch. Tang Yen looks proud when mentioning the detail that Tang Ba Wa is now also selling well in the Palace Museum. For her, it is hard to forget the time when the museum returned all the silk figurines she had made by strictly abiding by the norms of the specific traditional craftsmanship. Saving her workshop and preserving old tradition with innovation have proved to be a wise decision, and it has put her business to the right path. Tang Wa Wa is a product placed somewhere between art and toy. Though mass producing and commercialization have helped make it popular and brought returns for the company, Tang Yan has never been so clear about her original aspiration and where she is standing now and should be heading toward in the future. Entrepreneurial success should not become the only priority. Fine craftsmanship and artistic expression are equally important. Her Tang Wa Wa should retain the beauty and charm similar to the attraction that made her fall for the dolls she has collected all these years. I started by learning how to make a silk figurine. Although Tang Wa Wa has hit the market pretty well nowadays, this traditional handicraft line still lacks younger blood for further promotion and inheritance. But then, an opportunity came to me when I was sent for a public welfare project to Guizhou province over a decade ago. In between the mountains and waters of China's southwest Guizhou province, Tang Yan came across the local girls of the Miao ethnic minority group. Clear in mind and skillful in hand, many of the girls learned from their mothers and grandmothers to make crafts at a very early age. Some of them could even make their own clothes. But their talents have been restricted by the urgency of making money to support family. Without much education, most of them would end up doing manual chores in local villages or city communities. Recognizing the great potential in these girls, Tang Yen began to ponder how she could help them and utilize their talent after returning from her welfare trip. As if it were a response or an echo to what Tang Yen was planning to do, in that year, 2012, the city government officially listed the Beijing silk figurine as its intangible cultural heritage. That was when I established an intangible cultural heritage academy there in Guizhou. We don't charge any tuition fee for the girls. Instead, we'll offer them 300 to 500 RMB of living expenses per month if they decide to come. And apart from teaching them to make the Beijing silk figurine and Tang Wa Wa, I had traveled all across Guizhou to invite the best local handicraft masters over and teach my girls other local craft making skills like embroidery and wax painting, etc. 
According to Tang Yan, when it first opened in 2012, the academy was a full house, compelling her and fellow teachers to expand their classes and take in more students. The students were eager to learn. It is a life-changing opportunity they cherish. Tang Yan noticed familiar sparks in the eyes of the students. They were as brave as when she was young and determined to pursue her dreams. Upon graduation, several of them followed Tang Yan back to Beijing and followed her figurine-making core. Jin Feng is one of the girls Tang Yan feels most proud of. Her name means Golden Phoenix in English. In Tang Yan's eyes, these girls embody the beautiful and courageous birds that have flown thousands of miles in their quest for a better life. They have prospered through hard work and brought more public attention and aid to their hometown's development. According to Jin Feng, the girls have injected new blood into traditional figurine making. They help design and create figurines dressed up in traditional Miao clothes. These featured designs were especially popular in local tourist destinations. Many of our clients would request customized designs after our ethnic group series of silk figurines and Tang Wawa became popular. Throughout the journey, Ms. Tang has been very nice, but at the same time, strict with the quality of our work. Since we now needed to follow closely according to the client's requirements when making the dolls. Personally, I was enrolled in 2012, so I was among the oldest students of Miss Tang. I want to be just like her, while well, I could stay in this profession we both love and build a career upon it. Before joining the interview, Jin Feng attended an online meeting with the newly enrolled girls. She gave them a warm welcome and an introduction of what they would learn in the academy. It was a welcoming party for the academy's new students, and I was very excited. We all want traditional handicraft skills to be inherited from one generation to the next. It's a sense of mission for me, and I'm glad to be able to witness it happening. Hearing what Jin Feng was saying, Tang Yan looked up from her work, tutoring a young craftsperson. She smiled in silence, being careful not to disturb the attentive artisans and not to disrupt and break the pleasant ambiance of sewing, brushing and painting in the air. We left the workshop and went to the museum next door. Inside the museum, we saw the dolls and silk figurines Tang Yan inherited from her predecessors and dolls handmade and collected from elsewhere. For years, I've wanted to build a museum and put out exhibitions of my teacher's works. Unfortunately, both of my teachers passed away several years ago, and it was such a pity that not many people had seen their masterpieces before they left. So, in my museum, I display a lot of their works. When her eyes alight on her beloved dolls, Tang Yan becomes excited. Shuttling in between rows of exhibitions, she points at different dolls and proudly shares with us their history and background stories. See this one? It's a gift from my son, she says. That is the moment we saw a little doll-loving girl living in the body of an artisan who has inherited a traditional craftsmanship and has vowed to pass it down to generation after generation through preservation and innovation. With that, we conclude this episode of Footprints. Thanks for listening. A special thanks go to our reporter Liu Yushan. I'm Bob Jones. If you're interested in hearing more about the lives of ordinary but incredible people in China, follow us on Apple Podcasts. Just key in Footprints and you can find more stories anytime anywhere. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.